Welcome to everyone. My name is Erin McGue. I'm the Executive Director of the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. Tony, do we still have you? I think you need to unmute yourself. I'm unmute there. Wonderful. And Carolyn, hello. Hello. Welcome to everyone. We are uh, the Duxbury Rolling Historical Society, and this is our virtual tour of the Powder Point Bridge and its history. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Erin McGue, and I am pleased to welcome you all here tonight um, from so many different places. It's incredible, and it's my honor to welcome you all here to this virtual program. One piece of information that might be useful to you, again, if, if this is a, a new technology for you, is to look for speaker view, which is usually a button towards the top of your screen. If you click on that button, it actually goes directly to the person who's speaking. That might be helpful to you. We are welcoming here tonight our guests, town historian Tony Kelso. A warm thank you to Tony. He is always so supportive of our programs. Tony is the long-standing town historian in Duxbury, and he is especially noted for his knowledge of early town history, as well as his abundant knowledge of house history in town. Tony also generously gives his time to research house histories for our date board program, as well as numerous other programs as well. So Tony, thank you so much for being back with us tonight. We're really glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. We also welcome tonight the DRHS's own historian, Carolyn Ravenscroft. She is our archivist and has worked at the DRHS for 11 and a half years. Ooh. She's been instrumental. Did that shock you, Carolyn? <laughs> it always shocks me. <laughs> but Carolyn has been instrumental in some of our most iconic research projects, including unveiling the Bradford Sisters history, which led to national recognition a few years ago when our Bradford House Museum's reinterpretation won a Leadership in History Award from the American Association of State and Local History, which is also known as AASLH. More recently, Carolyn has presented well-received projects such as Duxbury's Women at Sea. So Carolyn, thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome. Together, this amazing duo is going to lead you on a wonderful tour of the iconic Duxbury landmark, the Powder Point Bridge and its history, and at the end, we'll answer your questions. The DRHS has been working really hard to recreate socially distanced programming that will continue to support our organization and needs, including the one that you are enjoying tonight. I hope you will visit our really our newly redesigned website if you have not already done so, and that you will find our online learning page, which is full of free content and video, some of which were submitted by Tony and by Carolyn. And there's more Duxbury history than you could ever want to know on that page. So I hope that you will go find it if you haven't already discovered it. Now, before we get started, I do want to just remind you of a few technical points. As I already mentioned, you might want to try to find the chat feature on your screen as well as the speaker view. Please note that all of you are muted and I'll ask that you continue to be muted for the rest of the program, not because we don't love your beautiful voices, but because it does cut down on the ambient noise um, for our speakers. And um, finally, um, all attendees are advised that this program is being recorded for future use. So we want to make sure that you know that as well. And with that, I welcome our speakers, Carolyn and Tony. Thank you. Oh, Tony, you're muted again. I know. I have a lot of background noise. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe you were going to make me carry this whole program. No, no, no. <laughs> um, hi, welcome, everyone. So tonight's program is um, a little different than maybe some of our other Zoom programs that you have seen. Tony and I decided to um, create the slideshow ahead of time, and we recorded the the the, tour, uh, the the lecture on the slides over the course of the last week or so, and we thought that this would be a good idea for this Zoom. Um, lecture because that keeps our comments kind of concise instead of both Tony and I are ramblers and we would perhaps take up the entire time just the two of us talking. So by pre-recording ourselves we kept ourselves to a script and that will give plenty of time at the end, ample time for your questions. 
So what you're going to see is in a few moments, I'm going to screen share and you're going to see the slideshow that Tony and I put together. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. I think, I think the photographs are very, very good in the information as well. You'll notice that there are a couple slides, and I apologize, where my voice is softer. So um, no, that's just a couple of times, and um, I think you'll be able to hear it fine, but I apologize ahead of time. I thought I'd have time to re-record my dulcet tones, um, but I ended up not. So um, I hope you'll all be, those couple slides, I hope you'll hear all right. Um, Tony, did you wanna? No, I, I think, I think you've said it all. <laughs> um, per usual. I mean, the only, um, the only thing to add is that we've uh, kind of go up to the rebuilding of the bridge um, in the late 1980s, and we don't go much beyond that. So that's just something to, to note. Very good, yes. It's more, this is more a history, uh, why the bridge exists, who built it, and um, it's, it's life here in Duxbury. Um, so Aaron, would you like me to screen share now? Is, did you have anything else to say? Okay. No, let's, let's get started. Let's All right, start. so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, post disabled attendee screen sharing. Oh, I can fix that. Well, okay. All right. <laughs> Give it a try now. Okie doke. Okay. And here we go. Welcome to the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society's presentation on the Powder Point Bridge of Duxbury. It is presented by town historian Tony Kelso and DRHS historian and archivist Carolyn Ravenscroft. We'll be talking about the long history of the bridge from its conception and building in 1892 until its rebuilding and dedication in 1987. This iconic landmark of Duxbury is a touchstone for so many. Up until and throughout most of the 19th century, Duxbury Beach was a place of industry as well as recreation. It was only accessible to Duxburyites, however, via an eight mile trek through Marshfield or by boat. This 1837 article lists salt as a commodity produced in Duxbury, including at a salt works on the beach. Indeed, the beach was sometimes referred to as Salter's Beach. It was also the site of fishing and hunting. But all was not work and no play at the beach. Townsfolk could sail across the bay or take a leisurely carriage ride there, where they could then enjoy a day-long picnic or clam bake. This map is from 1853 and shows the short distance from the end of Powder Point to Duxbury Beach. It's a geodetic survey map, so it also shows the channel to uh, the Back River and the Duck Hill Marshes. And this is the eventual site of the Powder Point Bridge. By the 1850s, Duxbury's shipbuilding had waned, leading to years of economic decline. In 1869, an event occurred that put Duxbury back. laid across the ocean floor from Brest, France, came ashore on Duxbury Beach. These images, taken by professional photographer Martin Chandler of Marshfield, were originally published as stereo views and sold to tourists. They depict the ship Great Eastern that carried the cable, as well as workmen at Duxbury Beach. The cable eventually made its way to Washington Street where the cable office was established. The event was a national sensation, as you can see by this illustration in Harper's Weekly, a popular publication of the time. Dignitaries descended on the town to partake of festivities held on Abrams Hill. Locals lucky enough to have an invitation witnessed messages sent and received from across the Atlantic for the first time. 
The success of the landing of the cable on Duxbury Beach and resulting publicity brought a real estate frenzy to Duxbury in the period from 1870 to 1872. During this period, the Duxbury Cohasset Railroad opened and the Miles Standish Hotel on Standish Shore opened and the dedication of the grounds of the future Miles Standish Monument occurred. During this period of real estate frenzy, the Duxbury Beach was still owned by the town of Duxbury, but in February 1872, town meeting agreed to sell the public beach to private investors who included Stephen Allen, George Loring, and Stephen Gifford, who then formed the Duxbury Bridge and Beach Company, who were to improve the beach by developing it and building a bridge from Powder Point. The grand plans of the Duxbury Bridge and Beach Company were dealt a, a death blow by the financially ruinous Boston Fire of November 1872 and the even greater financial panic of 1873 that engulfed the United States for a number of years. The beach was heavily mortgaged and was foreclosed on a number of times through the 1880s. The last holders of the mortgage foreclosed in 1887. This was the Wright family who were prominent in Duxbury. They consisted of George and Georgiana Wright and George's nephew, William. They had a large estate on St. George Street and were very interested in improving and developing their town of Duxbury. This 1879 map shows that thoughts of building a bridge between the mainland and beach were already well established. By 1891, some residents began to see the bridge as a public necessity, none more so than the rights. An agreement was drawn up between three parties to share in the estimated $30,000 construction cost. The Gurnet Bridge Company, spearheaded by the rights, would pay 10,000, the town of Duxbury, 10,000, and the county of Plymouth, the remainder. Frederick Bradford Knapp, the founder of the Powder Point School for Boys and erstwhile real estate developer himself, urged the construction to begin without delay. In anticipation of a bridge, the Wrights had gone ahead and drawn up plans for a cottage community consisting of 262 individual lots to be built along the beach. To entice prospective buyers, the Wrights also built three model homes on the beach, two between the bridge and High Pines and one at High Pines. You can see on the right in the brochure they published entitled Summer Homes of Duxbury, the three cottages on the beach in the distance. Construction on the bridge began in December 1891 and was completed by August 1892. The bridge was 2,200 feet long or four tenths of a mile long. It was 20 feet wide and the draw was 24 feet wide. There was a draw bridge in the middle of the bridge over the channel. The dedication of the bridge, known as Gurnet Bridge at that time, was in October 1892, and it was a day of gala celebrations, including a christening of the bridge with a bottle of champagne by the Wright's youngest daughter, Florence Wright, who was substituting for her mother, Georgiana, who was sick. But there was also a regatta, there was a parade, there were martial bands, and there were lots of foot races, including potato races and three-legged races. There was also a greased pole out over the channel from the draw. And the, the winner of the greased pole figured out that he had to run across the pole and grab the flag at the end. There was also a bike race from one end of the bridge back to the other. 
And the difficulty was getting over the draw bridge part of the main bridge. And the winner figured out how to do that with his bike that had a small wheel in the front and a large wheel in the back. The benefits of having the distance to the beach shortened by miles was seen almost immediately. The Boston Globe reported in 1893 that many were attracted to Duxbury because of the new bridge. Soon after the opening of the beach, the bridge was became very popular with residents and summer visitors alike for carriage rides out to Duxbury Beach. Development had not started out there yet and people could enjoy its full natural beauty. And as surf bathing became more popular, people enjoyed swimming as well and took in the full advantage of the seven miles of Duxbury Beach that were made accessible by the short distance on the Powder Point Bridge. In the pre-automobile era, just walking across the bridge and enjoying the beautiful breezy views of both beach and bay were very popular. But another sport enjoyed the Powder Point Bridge as well, and that was bicycle riding. The bikes did well on the smooth planked surface of that bridge. Shortly after the dedication of the bridge in 1893, the country experienced the financial panic of 1893 that lasted until 1897, which was a large damper on the Wright family's plans to develop Duxbury Beach. But the final death knell to the plans for lots of cottages on Duxbury Beach was the Portland Gale of 1898 which happened on November 26, 1898, which was a, a large scale northeasterly storm that heavily damaged the bridge, had washed throughs through the beach and the dunes were gone. And you can see in this left-hand picture, the damage to the bridge on the beach side. On the right-hand uh, picture is one of the Wright family cottages on Duxbury Beach and the damage that ensued after the storm of 1898. Let's quickly talk about the name of the bridge. I don't think anyone has ever called it Highway to the Sea other than this map maker in 1903, but the bridge has had many names. Initially, it was Gurnet Bridge or the bridge to the Gurnet. Locals then began to call it Long Bridge. Sometimes it's referred to as the Half Mile Bridge. Postcards of the early 20th century often refer to it as Duxbury Bridge. And we, of course, often refer to it as Powder Point Bridge. This artist's rendition of the beach and bridge shows very little development on the eastern end of Powder Point. The summer house of Oliver Briggs on today's Crooked Lane sits somewhat majestically alone. This was about to change. The Wrights, just as they had done with the beach, had purchased a large swath of land on Powder Point and divided it into house lots, although these lots were intended for larger summer estates, not small beach cottages. The inset photo, again from Summer Homes of Duxbury, shows prospective buyers the lot closest to the bridge, lot 23 on the accompanying map. The 1903 map shows a little more of the development of Powder Point. It was not only the right that were marketing Duxbury's many attractions to prospective summer residents, Frederick Bradford Knapp was selling lots as well. After spending a fun-filled day at the beach in 1910, this is the site you would see as you made your way across the bridge. The once barren point is slowly becoming populated with houses. During the final years of the Wright family ownership of Duxbury Beach, increasing numbers of people came across Powder Point Bridge to enjoy Duxbury Beach. Some of them even built shacks, small cabins, 
small uh, hunting lodges along the beach squatting on the right family property. This caused a problem for the Duxbury Beach Association that bought Duxbury Beach from the Wright family estate in 1919. It took them a number of years to remove the buildings and create a more pristine beach. By 1904, ownership of the bridge transferred to Plymouth County with Duxbury assisting in repairs. By 1929, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was eyeing the privately owned Duxbury Beach as a state reservation. Its evaluation of the bridge, however, found the old wooden structure wanting. Costs for refurbishment exceeded $500,000. In the state's estimation, the bridge was best torn down. While residents of Duxbury were heartily in favor of the beach becoming state owned, demolishing the bridge was, quote, a horse of a different color. 403 residents signed a petition to save the bridge. This postcard shows uh, cars parking on Powder Point Bridge, uh, which put a continued strain on the structure of the bridge. And in 1931, the Duxbury Beach Association agreed to build a parking lot at the east end of the bridge one right at the end of the bridge for residents and a public one up towards the Marshfield town line. In 1938, the town agreed to take full responsibility for the maintenance and ownership of the Powder Point Bridge. And in 1941, the ownership transferred totally to the town of Duxbury. Within 45 years of its construction, the bridge has become such a part of Duxbury's history that the Tercentenary Committee, celebrating Duxbury's 350th anniversary in 1937, chose to include a photo of it on a typical day with both fishermen and sightseers enjoying themselves. This shows a popular postcard view of the Powder Point Bridge. It also clearly shows the draw in the middle of the bridge, which was used by small boats going between the Back River area and Duxbury Bay. Originally, the draw was operated by a part-time operator during the summer months. His name was Edward Guar. He lived on Powder Point and he was there until 1900 when he moved to New Jersey. After that time, the draw was operated by individual boat owners who, if they wished to pass through the bridge, had to park at the bridge, climb up the ladder, pull up the draw, sail their boat through, climb up the, the ladder again, and pull the draw down. In the 1920s and 30s, Powder Point Bridge suffered damage from numerous winter storms that affected both the bridge and the pilings that the bridge sat on. One time in the 1930s, they had to get a steamroller from Brockton that ironed out the bridge because the pilings had pushed up, been pushed up by the ice flows. This is a picture from 1957 showing the last of the draw um, being uh, floating away after it was damaged in a winter storm. The draw was uh, not used after the 1930s. After World War II, Duxbury Beach was more popular than ever, putting increased strain on the now more than 60-year-old wooden bridge. The 1963 photograph on the left, taken during the winter months, shows a substructure to the bridge that was in dire need of repair. Although a major renovation occurred in the bicentennial year of 1976, it did not solve the bridge's problems. This is another iconic view of Powder Point Bridge from Duxbury Beach and in the 1980s and how the repairs of the 1970s staved off the inevitable for a few years. This early 1980s postcard is the last produced of the old bridge. 
Those enjoying themselves are blissfully unaware of how precariously they were perched above the water. The bridge at this point was held together by a wish and a prayer, and its luck was about to run out. 1985 was a pivotal year for the old Powder Point Bridge. In June of 1985, a fire broke out, supposedly started by a fisherman's lantern that burned a section of the bridge. And in doing the repairs, they discovered much more damage. And so the bridge was closed to all pedestrian and vehicular traffic on July 23rd, 1985. There was a hope that the old bridge could be salvaged, but while examining the fire damage, it was revealed just how unsafe the bridge had become. These engineering photos show the dire straits that the bridge was in. And again here, you can see for yourself the condition of the bridge. The engineer examining it gave the substructure a zero. In September 1985, a special town meeting was held where the town meeting agreed to $250,000 to be spent for an engineering study of the bridge. Um, and then the, a new committee was appointed and the new committee selected a design firm that presented five different alternatives for a new bridge. Two were concrete bridges, two were steel bridges and one was a wooden bridge made to replicate the old bridge with tropical hardwoods that were resistant to marine bores and fire. In 1986, at the annual spring town meeting, the committee presented the five options for the new Powder Point Bridge. The town overwhelmingly chose the tropical hardwood wooden version and appropriated $3 million for the construction of that new bridge. Construction began later that year, although it was fraught with a number of difficulties and setbacks. Choosing to build with wood also meant choosing the type of wood. The original bridge was made of southern yellow pine the new bridge is constructed with exotic woods. The piles come from South America and the superstructure is made of an African wood from the Ivory Coast. On August 29, 1987, the newly built Powder Point Bridge was dedicated. Like the original, it is 2,200 feet long, but it is two feet higher to accommodate a rise in sea level. There is a five to six foot rise in the middle that was not present before, and the sidewalk is one foot wider. I believe this rebuild lost the bridge its world record as the oldest and longest wooden bridge, not because it lost length, but because it lost its age. It was already shorter than other wooden bridges in the world. Its distinction had been the combination of years and length. We end this presentation as we began with an iconic and beautiful image of the Powder Point Bridge. We hope you have enjoyed the presentation and look forward to answering your questions. Okay. Thank you, Tony and Carolyn. That was wonderful. Um, I encourage anyone who has any questions to go ahead and drop them into the chat uh, feature that's on your screen. Uh, Carolyn and Tony, I definitely, I see one from Drew Dolly here that might have been partially answered already, but he would like to know um, how the drawbridge was operated on a schedule or was it managed actively? So if a boat approached, someone would raise them. Um, well, the, the draw is a puzzle, but, but there definitely in the early years was an operator um, who, who pulled it up um, for the boats going uh, back and forth. Um, but he did uh, move away from Duxbury after 1900, and then it depended on 
people who were actually sailing the boats to pull up the draw uh, and all. And there were peers, as far as we can tell from the plans and the pictures, there were sort of peers on, on um, the ends of the draw to, to help kind of channel the boats, I think, through the, the draw part of the bridge. Uh, and then by, um, at least by the 30s, if not before, um, a lot of the mechanisms seems to have rusted or, or whatever, and it wasn't operated. I had one come, um, come in to me via email prior to this program, which I know you can answer because I've heard you answer it before, Tony. Where does the name Powder Point come from? Um, that's a great question. Uh, the earliest records are from the 1630s, the Plymouth Colony records, and it was known as Polder Point. Polder being uh, really a Dutch word for sort of low marshy ground uh, that gets diked um, for various reasons. And um, the part of Powder Point near, um, well, sort of where um, Bay Pond Road is today, and and that uh, part was was apparently diked that way early on. So the whole point uh, became known as Polder Point, which which sort of segued over the hundreds of years into Powder Point. Very interesting, Carolyn. What happened to the rights? Oh, what happened to the rights? So if you saw in the beautiful um, portraits, there was Georgiana and she was married to George. Um, George passed and then she married George's nephew, William, the other man in, in the portraits. And um, Georgiana was the last of the rights to survive. And um, we often tell the story that St. George Street was named for um, Georgiana's son and husband, who were both named George and had predeceased her, and she asked to have the name of Harmony Street changed to St. George Street. So when Georgiana died, she was the last of the rights. She survived her children, and the only person that was left of um, the Wright family was an in-law in Virginia, and that is how we often tell the story of how the Wright estate, that big beautiful mansion that they lived in, ended up leaving the Wright family and going through different machinations before it became the site of the former high school, which is now the playing fields. Uh, Laura Emerson Duns asks a question, a, pic from, a picture from the bridge towards Powder Point at some point, she recalls, showed a tall structure was there a wooden tower of some sort back in the day on the point? I think, and, and Tony can correct me here, but I think what she may have been seeing is um, a water tower or a windmill. You know, before town water, everybody had their own individual windmills. And so that, I think, if she's referring to the postcard that we just showed, that that would have been a windmill, a uh, privately owned water wind, um, energy source. Right. The, the town didn't get um, town water until 1914. And previous to that, um, particularly many um, well-off summer residents had either water towers or windmills or both to pump their, their water. Let's see. The questions are coming fast and furious here. Selden Terse asks, how many houses total were built on the beach? Just the three shown on the postcard? Yes, right. The, there were only the three. Um, and again, it, uh, I think they, they, were, um, they were considered sort of model cottages. Um, nobody apparently expressed much interest in them. Uh, and the rights continued to own them up until the entire property, including the houses, were sold to the Duxbury Reservation. And then um, in 1926, uh, they were floated off by barge to Landing Road, uh, but it was only those three uh, that were ever built. Anything more, Carolyn? No, just that those three houses still exist, and I think one of the new owners of those houses might be part of uh, our audience this evening, uh, but those three houses still exist on Landing Road, so built on the beach, currently mainland. 
see, there's some questions about the bridge itself. Um, can you see if I can put them together? Um, when did Duxbury start charging a fee to go through the bridge? Do either of you know? I don't. To that, Tony's been here longer than I have. Well, uh, the, the, nobody charges a fee for traveling on the bridge. There were there are beach, um, you know, stickers uh, that the town buys. You know, I honestly don't remember when they started doing that. It was, if anybody else does, I believe it had to have been in the 70s. And I should correct, I, the, the question actually reads, charging a fee to go on the beach through Powder Point. I misread right. it originally. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was sometime in the 70s um, because as, as uh, I'm sure many of you know, the um, beach is owned by the Duxbury Beach uh, Reservation Group and leased to the town each year. And part of the leasing um, uh, rights and all uh, were uh, the, the fees are, are charged to help support the town's um, expenses for the beach. Um, I think the question, does any, uh, that sort of last call for questions, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to drop them into the, into the chat box. A uh, couple of questions uh, about the bridge in its current stage, which I'm, I'm not sure either of you know how the bridge is currently holding up, that, that question is on here. Um, maybe there's somebody else on the call who might be able to jump in on that one. Um, and then there's another question, when the town voted for a wooden bridge, how did the cost compare to the, compare to the other options? I think it was significantly more. I don't know how much more, but it was definitely more expensive to do the wooden bridge uh, than any of the other uh, proposed ideas. Okay. Um, uh, we have one of the owners of the, the houses on here, 17 Landing Road is on here. So <laughs> thumbs up for owning one of those homes. Oh, I see a question, Erin, about, yeah. um, so uh, about the Guinness Book of World Records record, um, Tony and I, this is a discussion Tony and I have had for years. Um, and what I would like to find, and if anybody has this, what was the record? There's a lot of hearsay about I was told, I heard, and it's like broken telephone. And when you go to research the bridge, there's a lot of repeat of the same information, like in the 80s or in the 70s, it received a Guinness Book of World Record or a record or I need to see the actual language of the record because it is far, far short of the longest wooden bridge in the world. It is not, even if we talk about the 1890s two structure, uh, the oldest wooden bridge in the world. Um, that is held by Japan, both length and age. Um, there is a longer wooden bridge in America, in Louisiana. So I, I you know, Guinness or any of the, anybody that gives out a record, there's often a lot of qualifiers. And my, I suspect uh, that the record might sound something like the longest, oldest wooden bridge in North America that cars and pedestrians can go over. You know, there's, there's probably language in there. So if anybody has ever actually seen a document or the Guinness book that has the record in it, I would be very interested in seeing it and kind of figuring out what the record was and how it lost the record. Troy asks, when did the guard shack come in? On the beach side? Ooh, it's been there a long time. I, I, I'm going to defer to someone in the audience if they can remember, but um, I don't know. Are there any further questions from the audience? Because I'm going to open it up to the audience now. If anybody has a favorite memory of the Powder Point Bridge that they would like to share with the group, um, I'm going to let you raise your hand and I'll see if I can unmute you. 
we have any volunteers? Put, how about you? Oh, Put, I'm sorry, we don't seem to have volume on you right now. Try again. Oh, I'm sorry, Put, we don't seem to have volume. We'll try you again in a few minutes. Is there somebody else who would like to share a favorite memory? You can raise your hand. Any takers? Okay. Oh, I have got one more question coming through. Question, what was the relationship between the lighthouse and the bridge? Um, Mary Bradshaw, do you mean the Gurnet light or the little house at the end of the bridge that was built to look like a lighthouse? Can Mary, like... Okay, so the little house at the end of the bridge is a house specifically built to be a quirky looking lighthouse. Frederick Bradford Knapp, I believe, built that. He was, I mentioned, the erstwhile developer himself. So, uh, and Tony can chime in here as well, but um, we both looked into the history of that house and it is just a quirky little cute house built to be resemble a lighthouse. It is not, nor ever was, a functioning utilitarian lighthouse. It was built in the 1920s. Great. All right, well with that I would like to issue a warm thank you to Carolyn Ravenscroft and to Tony Kelso for joining us tonight and for that very interesting tour of the Powder Point Bridge. And as a final thought, B. Bornheimer shares with us that she used to jump off of the old bridge so that she leaves us with that warm memory of the bridge. Thank you all of you for joining at the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society for our tour tonight. Um, please keep an eye out for our future programs. It was great to see you all tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good night.